Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today, I thought we could do something a little more fun, and I thought we could dive into some TV shows and look at some of the crimes they used as inspiration for their episodes. If you like this kind of content, please let me know by liking and commenting down below. I had a lot of fun doing this, and I could honestly do a series, but anyway, let's get into it. Number 1. Candace Newmaker In Season 2 of CSI Las Vegas, clearly the superior of the franchise, we see Nick and Catherine investigating the death of a teenage boy. The woman and her therapist were attempting what is called rebirthing therapy. It is very real and a very controversial form of psychodynamic therapy involving a birther and a breather. Although it is mainly practiced in the U.S., it is not recognized by the American Academy of Pediatrics or the American Psychiatric Association. The breather is wrapped up in a physical barrier such as a blanket and they need to get out of the barrier which is meant to represent the birth canal. Such a technique was used on Candace Newmaker, a 10-year-old in Colorado. Candace had been born Candace Tierra Elmore and had been born in North Carolina. She and her two siblings grew up in a chaotic household. Her family moved constantly, and her father was a violent alcoholic. Candace was only three when she and her siblings were removed by social services and put into foster homes. After four years in six different foster homes, she was adopted by a single 42-year-old pediatric nurse, Jean Newmaker. Her new adopted parent changed her name and kept her separated from her siblings. Candace began seeing a psychiatrist soon after moving into her new home, with Jean often complaining that Candace had behavior issues and a bad attitude. She had Candace medicated, but insisted that the issues were getting worse. Keep in mind, Candace was only seven. Jean alleged that Candace had begun playing with matches and intentionally killed her pet goldfish. In 2000, a now 10-year-old Candace was packed into the car and driven to Evergreen, Colorado for a two-week and $7,000 intensive session for attachment therapy. The goal was to bond Candace and Jean. Jean felt this would help bond the two and also improve Candace's alleged behavior issues. During this two-week therapy session, Candace was diagnosed with RAD, Reactive Attachment Disorder, which was a popular diagnosis for adopted children at the time. They underwent hours of therapy headed by two unlicensed therapists, Connell Watkins and Julie Ponder. The last session of the program was the rebirthing session. The session was video recorded. Candace was wrapped in a blanket and she was told to scream and cry like a baby and wiggle out of the blanket. Four adults, weighing a collective 673 pounds, began to put pressure on Candace and restrict her movement. For 70 minutes, Candace yelled, begging for air and to be let go. She couldn't get out of the blanket and said innumerable times she couldn't breathe. The adults shouted at her and said she was a quitter and a twerp, and when Candace said she was dying, one of the therapists yelled at her, You want to die? Okay, then die. Go ahead, die, right now. Candace eventually passed out, and by the time she was unwrapped, her lips and fingertips were blue. When she was unwrapped, Dr. Watkins said, Oh, there she is, sleeping in her vomit. It was Newmaker, who was watching from a monitor in another room, who noticed the color of Candace's lips and rushed in to perform CPR. Watkins then called 911, and paramedics arrived 10 minutes later. Paramedics were able to restore her pulse, but she was declared brain dead at the hospital and passed of her injuries. Her cause of death was officially brainstem herniation and cerebral edema, suffocation. A year later, Watkins and Ponder were convicted of reckless endangerment and death of a child and received 16-year prison sentences each. The other two adults involved were given 10-year sentences and Jean Newmaker pleaded guilty to neglect and abuse and was given a four-year suspended sentence, after which the charges were expunged from her record. 
Candace's death led to Candace's Law in Colorado and North Carolina, making illegal the practice of reenacting the birth experience. Number 2. Dr. John Schneeberger In Law & Order Special Victims Unit Season 5, we saw a bizarre episode where the suspect provided a blood sample to investigators for a paternity test. Shockingly, the DNA didn't match despite all other evidence pointing to their suspect. In the Law & Order episode, the DNA matched a cold case of a sexual assault case. When their suspect was murdered during an autopsy, the coroner found a tube inserted into his arm containing blood. The suspect had taken blood from one of his patients, filled a plastic tube with that blood, and then inserted it into his arm. When the police had requested a DNA sample, he willingly allowed them to draw their sample from that tube. Now this might seem super crazy, but this actually happened in Canada. In 1992, in a small town in Kipling, Saskatchewan, a 23-year-old woman whose name has been withheld from publication, but we will call her Carol, was upset following a breakup with her boyfriend and went to the local hospital to see her friend who was a nurse there. Her friend wasn't at the hospital that day, and staff were concerned about how upset she was and asked if she wanted to see a doctor. Carol was taken to an exam room and was seen by a doctor named John Schneeberger. She knew the doctor, it was a small town after all, but he had also delivered her first child a few years prior. He was a man that she had trusted, and when he offered her a sedative, she didn't think anything of it. She had expected a pill or tablet and was surprised when what he gave her was administered with a needle. Carol knew something wasn't right right away. The medicine made her numb. She described the feeling as when a dentist puts freezing in your mouth and you can't feel pain, but you know that something is happening. She she could feel pressures with her body, but she couldn't move. She was conscious, but she had no ability to move. She couldn't fight back when she felt her doctor assaulting her. When he left her, Carol felt the effects of the drug slowly wear off. She was in shock and disbelief, but she was positive that something bad had happened. She removed her underwear and put it in a bag. The next day, she drove for two hours to a woman's clinic to have a rape kit administered. There, they found semen on her underwear, the jeans she wore that night, and on a vaginal swab removing any doubt as to what had happened at the hospital. The clinic also took blood work, and there they found an unusual drug in her system, Versed, a pre-anesthetic that isn't a normal sedative a doctor would prescribe for someone needing to calm down. From there, Carol filed a police report. When police went to the hospital to begin their investigation, Schneeberger willingly volunteered a blood sample to compare to the DNA profile from the attack. When word in town began to spread about the accusation, the town was shocked. Schneeberger was highly respected in the community. He had a wife and a family. No one had ever accused him of such an attack before. Carol, however, was a young, unwed mother, and people in town accused her of lying in order to get settlement money, or perhaps had a crush on the doctor and was seeking revenge for unrequited feelings. When Schneeberger's blood came back as not a match, Carol filed a complaint saying the test wasn't handled properly or it had been tampered with. Following the complaint, the RCMP did a second test, and this time, the police stood by and watched the blood get drawn, the sample sealed, and then delivered the blood themselves to the forensic lab for testing. Once again, the DNA didn't match, and the police closed their investigation. When the investigation was closed, Carol took matters into her own hands and hired a private investigator. The investigator broke into Schneeberger's car. In it, they found a lip balm. The lip balm was sent to the lab, and in it, they found enough cells to pull a DNA profile, and the profile matched Carol's attacker. Carol took the test back to the police, but nothing could be done. Schneeberger had provided DNA samples willingly, twice, and neither matched her attacker. The DNA from the lip balm had been obtained illegally, with no way of knowing if it even belonged to Schneeberger. There was nothing more that could be done for Carol, according to RCMP. Carol sued in the civil courts, and this time Schneeberger would have his blood drawn directly at the 
1997, five years after Carol's attack, there was a break in the case. Another victim came forward. This time, it was Schneeberger's 15-year-old stepdaughter, whom he had been abusing for years. His stepdaughter said that he would come into her room at night, give her medicine with a needle, and abuse her. His wife discovered condoms, vials of Versed, and syringes in their home and called police. From there, he was arrested and forced to provide multiple sources of DNA, including hair, saliva, and blood. This time, the DNA profile matched Carol's attacker as well as the DNA from his stepdaughter. Faced with this, he was asked how DNA in his blood didn't match the DNA taken from his mouth and hair, and he revealed how he had tricked law enforcement. He had inserted a plastic tube into his arm, filled with a patient's blood and anticoagulants, and inserted it under the skin in his biceps. As the years went on, the blood eventually degraded, explaining why, in 96, his blood wasn't able to be tested. In 1999, he went to trial and was found guilty of sexual assault, administering noxious substances, and obstruction of justice and received six years in prison. Following his release, he was deported back to South Africa, where he was affectionately referred to as Dr. Rape and has yet to be able to practice medicine again. It took seven years for Carol to get justice and prove to her community she was telling the truth. She fought so hard because she wanted to protect other women. Schneeberger's ex-wife publicly apologized to Carol, saying, I still blame myself. Maybe if I had believed her, none of this would have happened to my daughter. Well, that's going to be it for this video. Please let me know if you like this type of content because I really enjoyed making it and I have lots more cases I could do. Thank you so much for tuning in and hanging out until the end. As always, please give this video a thumbs up if you like the content and subscribe for more if you haven't already. If you've done all that and want to support me in the channel, we have channel membership where you can get early access, members only content, and much more. We also have merch and other goodies in the description box as well as all the links to my socials. But until then, I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.